This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. And welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne, and this is another of our episodes where we look back at England at the European Championships in the run up to this year's tournament. Now, we've already covered 1980 and the disasters that were 1988 and 1992, and the previous one was when football came home. Now, they're all available to listen to at 3 com or your usual podcast provider. I'd love to hear your feedback on them and your memories too. Now, this episode, we look at Euro 2000. Euro 2000 was the first European tournament to be jointly hosted by two nations. The two neighbouring countries held it between the 10th of June and the 2nd of July. UEFA awarded it to Belgium and Holland, and they gave it to them back in 1995, ahead of separate bids from Spain and Austria. Now, like Euro 96 before it in England, it was a 16-team tournament, four groups of four, with both Belgium and Holland hosting. Neither had to go through a qualifying campaign. England, on the other hand, eventually progressed via the playoffs after finishing second in Group 5 behind Sweden. And it was a group that also featured Poland, Bulgaria and Luxembourg. Frankly, England made a bit of a pig's ear of it. Qualification began in September 1998 with Glenn Hoddle at the helm and shortly after the France World Cup. England's first game was away to Sweden, and despite Alan Shearer scoring in the first minute of the game, they went down 2-1. A 0-0 draw at home to Bulgaria followed, then a 3-0 away win in Luxembourg, Gareth Southgate scoring late on, his first of two international goals. Now, Glenn Hoddle had started the campaign as manager, But later on in the campaign, a piece in the Times newspaper where he spoke about the disabled and reincarnation saw him sacked by the FA from the job. Howard Wilkinson came in for a friendly against France before then Fulham manager Kevin Keegan came in on a four-game temporary basis. His first game saw Paul Scholes score a hat-trick in a 3-1 win against Poland at Wembley But successive draws against Sweden at home and Bulgaria away meant four points dropped. September 1999 came around and Alan Shearer grabs a hat-trick in a 6-0 win over Luxembourg. But another 0-0, this time against Poland, meant England finished with 13 points. Nine behind group winners Sweden. Poland too finished on 13 but England progressed with a better head-to-head points. Second place meant a playoff place. Already qualified alongside the hosts were the Czech Republic, Norway, Sweden, Spain, Italy, the then current holders Germany, France, Romania, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and Portugal. Now, there were eight second-place teams vying for the last four places in the tournament, and they were going to get them through the playoffs. They were ourselves, Scotland, Israel, Denmark, Slovenia, Ukraine, the Republic of Ireland and Turkey. England, well, they were drawn against Scotland, the old enemy, in a two-legged game. And the first was away at Hamden, November the 13th, 1999. Two first-half goals from Paul Scholes gave England the upper hand. And four days later, Scotland came to Wembley, winning 1-0 thanks to a Don Hutchinson goal. But it wasn't enough for them as England went through 2-1 on aggregate. 
Kevin Keegan by now had been made manager and he had the arduous task of picking his 22 to face Group A opposition in the form of Portugal, Germany and Romania. He chose three goalkeepers, David Seaman, Nigel Martin and Richard Wright. Defenders, brothers Gary and Phil Neville. Sol Campbell, Tony Adams, Martin Keown, Gareth Southgate and Gareth Barry. In midfield, David Beckham, Paul Scholes, Steve McManaman, who at the time was the only player in the squad playing abroad. He was playing at Real Madrid. Paul Lintz, Steven Gerrard, Dennis Wise and Nick Barmby. And then up front, Keegan picked Shearer, Owen, Emil Heskey, Robbie Fowler and Kevin Phillips. Let's remind ourselves of how the two English television channels introduced the tournament. As per normal, both went classical and the BBC with Francisco Godoy Baselli's Canto della Terra. And ITV went with Benjamin Britten's A Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Now, as with the previous episodes where we've looked back at England at the European Championships, we've spoken with a supporter who was there. And this one is no different. My name's Ian Dunk. Leicester fan, home and away, have been for 30-odd years. Uh, lived just outside the city and followed Leicester since 1978. It was pretty much 10 years after that with my good buddy Daryl Ball, who goes with me everywhere to football games, that we decided to jump on the uh, the England journey. And so 1988 was my first tournament. And by the time it got to Euro 2000, that was my seventh tournament. Um, wow. So, yeah, we, we did America as well. Uh, obviously, England didn't qualify, but just because we could get tickets a lot easier than you can probably these days. So, um, so yeah, Euro 2000. Uh, and I can't believe it, it's nearly 20 years ago. It's it's staggering. And I'm glad you're doing this podcast because it made me go up in the loft, get my programs down that I've got from oh, Euro right. 2000. I've always been one of these guys that carries a camera around. I know it's a bit sad. And in fact, my mate calls me sad shots. But before you could have phones with automatic cameras in them, I always used to take um, take a you know just an Instamatic with me, and I've got photo albums going back through all the tournaments I've seen, and it made me get my photo album out from from two thousand. So uh, yeah, it's been a really good thing just to just to look back through the tournament again. Oh, so lots of pics of of Eindhoven and Shawa and, and any other games you may have been well, to. Not that many, because of course in those days it was a twenty four or a thirty six film. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't never ending, so you just tended to go with just a twenty-four. So uh, it's surprising how few pictures you did take, but it's uh, it's nevertheless good memories. And uh, yeah, Eindhoven being the first uh, the first game that we went to. Yes. So well, take us back to two thousand. You say it's uh, nigh on twenty years ago. How did you get tickets for it all? So much easier in those days. Um, say my first tournament was nineteen eighty-eight. This was my seventh uh, watching uh, watching major tournaments. It wasn't internet. I'm sure it was through the post. You used to just, I was a member of the, the members club, as it was called then, the England members club. And he used to do everything through the post. I'm sure that was the same in 2000, where you just got a an A4 piece of paper. You ticked the games that you wanted and uh, the categories you would accept and you posted it. And then you found out whether you were fortunate enough uh, or not. So it was as soon as really the inter- internet became mainstream, uh, there was a lot more demand for tickets. So probably in those days, it was a bit easier to get them. Right. Now, before the, the tournament came around, I was trying to remember back. Were, were there sort of scare stories about it? Because I'm not sure so much about Belgium, but Holland obviously had that a little bit of a stigma about it. Yeah, I mean, but I had all those. You know, I just always ignored the news. France 98, Italia 90, even Euro 88, all of the scare stories always used to ignore them and, and and honestly i've seen 10 major tournaments watching england and i honestly mean this i've never seen a punch thrown i've never been in a situation where i felt uncomfortable 
And admittedly, I'm not one of these that goes and stands outside a bar singing my heart out with a St. George's flag behind me. But and I'm not saying that, that, that you shouldn't do that. But I've never, ever believed the, uh, the scare stories. And I, uh, there was a flawless tournament for me. Right. It was, it was the first joint Euros, wasn't it, between Belgium and Holland? Yeah. And I must say, out of all the ones I've seen, it was probably the... <laughs> It was sort of the most bland, if you like. It was the thing you think, oh, I can't wait to get across to Belgium. Normally, Belgium was the place you drive through, isn't it, on the way to an England game? Uh, and you know, I we know never stop there, do we? <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Yeah, I forgot that it was the um, it was the first joint one. And I was just looking back through through uh, the stats. It was the I think I'm right. It was the last time Yugoslavia played in a in a major tournament. I'm sure it was. And in fact, 1986 was my first England game at Wembley. And it was against Yugoslavia. We won two nil. Bobby Robson was the manager. I'm pretty sure that that was the last tournament that Yugoslavia featured in in a major tournament. Well, they, they were under the guise of the former Republic of Yugoslavia, were they? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Before it split, and um, I think you had Serbia, Montenegro, that kind of break up after that. So I'm, I'm fairly sure of that. And as I say, I dug my program out the loft, and and that was what made me realise there it is, clearly in black and white, Yugoslavia as a team. So I'm pretty sure that's right. And and do you remember how much your tickets cost back then? Yeah, well, it was thirty euro. We had a mixture of categories. So there was the three games: there's the Portugal, Germany, and the, and the um, Romania games. It was category three price was thirty euros, and a category two price uh, was fifty euros. So, I mean, of course, nearly twenty years ago, that still seems a lot, but you know, the, I think the pound was a bit stronger then, so it, it didn't feel painful, shall we say, mm. buying the tickets. And I must say, we did. Uh, we didn't go out there for the whole tournament. We went to the first game in Eindhoven and then we came back home again and then we went back out for the next two games. So it was close enough for us to come home, do a bit more work and, you know, all the commitments before going back out. So we sort of visited, visited the tournament twice. So this was, I guess, the, the Euro Tunnel would have been open then, was it? It would have been, but we went by Hovercraft, the, the <laughs> Sea Cat, which you can't get anymore, I don't believe. Yeah, we went by Hovercraft and... Uh, you know, that amazing thing where you strap yourself in like you're in an aircraft and this thing <laughs> skip across the waves until it got to, I'm sure it was Dover to Calais. So, uh, but what we decided to do was we based ourselves, it may seem strange, but in Le Touquet in France. Yeah, okay. Which is just a few miles away from the hovercraft ferry terminal. And we chose that because it was about 200 mile drive to Eindhoven. But the place, you know, we sort of based ourselves there for two or three days, full of bars, full of restaurants, my mate and I are the kind of guys that watch every single game of a tournament. You know, we have to see every game as long as we're not in transit. And um, so we based ourselves in Le Touquet, went up to the Eindhoven game, saw that game, came back to Le Touquet and then went home before coming back out again. So that was a, th- that's what we felt was a good base. And we still laugh these days that we went to Le Touquet for a tournament that wasn't in France. Right. Yes, I see. <laughs> well, let's let's talk that, that first game. Well, yeah. if we must. Remember it well. Remember it yeah, well. So- Portugal were the opposition, uh, 12th of June 2000, I say in Hindhoven in, in the Netherlands. We went 2-0 up, didn't we? Honestly, it was um, it was one of those games, it, before you knew it, I think McManaman may have got the second, but there were two early goals, I seem to remember. And um, I thought, this is easy, this is amazing. We, we, and then reality struck. I mean, Portugal that day were absolutely brilliant. Figo, he just ran the show. And... I remember after we'd gone two 0 up, that was about our last. It seemed to be our last attack, and they just dominated the match, dominated midfield. We couldn't keep the ball, and it was one of those games. You know, you sometimes play in as an amateur where you think we're going to lose this, even though you're winning. And they were just brilliant, Portugal, and we we just weren't we weren't equal to them as a team. I know we had good individual players out there, but uh, to race to that 2-0 lead and then think, we're not going to win this. Uh, and they just they just mastered us throughout the whole tournament, uh, throughout the whole game, sorry. Because this was probably the the start of, uh, of, I don't really like using this for this term, but the, the golden generation really, wasn't it? It was the, almost the beginning of it. Yeah, uh, but we, we just weren't a team. Uh, as we'll talk about the other games later in the tournament, we were just not, we just could not control that ball in the middle of the park. And uh, I thought Portugal were brilliant that day. And when they eventually went three two up, uh, you know, the England support I remember was almost it was it was it was expected. You know, it just was on the cards. It was one of those games. We 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 just weren't going to be good enough that day, and we weren't. Right. 
so lost the first game um back to back to the 2k then was it back, back to the 2k for the night then back home a couple right. of days work so i think that was monday the 12th of june and in fact i remember that portugal game by the way uh, because when we got back into the 2k it was a night game so it was the next day i don't know if you remember david beckham had a dispute with some fans at the tunnel i seem to remember okay. um they were shouting some abuse about his wife or something that was unnecessary and he shouted back, the cameras caught it. And I think that got a lot of traction in the news at the time. And I remember some French supporters coming up to me and says, Beckham hates you. And of course, it was not the fact. And he reacted to something that wasn't very pleasant. But uh, I definitely remember there was a, a flare up then, which which uh, which the new pa- newspapers covered. But, you know, we left the game, went to the 2K, came home and then we were back out because that game was on the Monday at Eindhoven. The next game we had was the Saturday at Schalwa. And this was against Germany wasn't it? Big game. Uh, big game. Big game because we'd lost the first and, you know, you lose to Germany, you're out. Now, I when I started looking into this tournament and I was trying to bring back all my memories and I was reading various articles on it, this was held in Shawa and it's. I remember there was so much news about the ground saying that it was going to be unsuitable i think i don't know was it panorama or bbc news i I mean you obviously said that you don't believe everything in the news but they made a real big thing that this ground wasn't suitable well i don't remember that but what i will say is it was it was a shame we're in shawa for two matches because it was just a it wasn't a very good ground at all It, it really wasn't and I've got a picture of where the, the, the stand on the on the left side, opposite the main stand, opposite the tunnel, is just this sheer almost drop of three tiers that you don't know how they've actually squeezed it in, and it's 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 in the middle of this nondescript town. Unfortunately for the people that live there, but it is. It was a nondescript town, and it was just unfortunate that it was a stadium that was probably one of the poorest, you know, not so good stadiums in the in the whole tournament. You know, we didn't get one of the good ones in Brussels, for example. And we got Shawa twice, which was very unfortunate, I felt. Right. So this this was Germany. Obviously, you got one of the one of our biggest enemies, as it were. But they, they were going through a bit of a, a transitional phase as well, I think, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, going back to the ground again, I think there's only about 30,000 was the capacity. But yeah, it was a, it was a big game, and I remember it wasn't it wasn't the most pulsating of games. We won it, and I haven't looked this up. I think from memory, it was Shearer. We we're on the upper tier behind the opposite goal, and I'm sure Shearer scored maybe in the second half. But it was just one of those games where it wasn't the Germany that you uh, that we've probably experienced in previous years. But we deserved to win. It was you'd say it was a hard fought game, but it was great to to win it at the time i remember it was so important it was so important it was germany it was so important we had to win and um i remember it being a fantastic night i remember calling my wife afterwards who was at uh, at a wedding do and uh, <laughs> my wife lara is a, a massive football fan and she got told off for basically spending most of the time watching the game rather than being at sort of the the evening uh-huh. reception um but i remember it was so important that we we won that game and and we deserved it and uh yeah it was it was it was terrific at the time uh, and a massive win yes i mean to to lose your first game you have to win your next one uh, and one thing that struck me about that game uh for the the sort of the shirt nerds out there both teams what i believe wore their away colors yeah we definitely didn't wear white i know that we we wore red, and I believe well, we Germany did, uh, wore a uh, sort of a, a dark greenish affair. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they both lost the toss to wear the home <laughs> shirt or what, but uh, that was something that that stood out for me on that one. Yeah, yeah, I do remember. I certainly remember that England didn't uh, didn't play in their their normal colours, which was a strange one. But uh, it was, you know, looking back, it was it was fantastic to be there. One thing I remember from getting because we drove from Le k because we went back to Le k to right. base ourselves there again. We drove to to Shawa and um, from memory I think we had a, a train in we did there was a sort of a metro train so there was official parking but it's the first real time I've gone to a town and because it was a relatively small town you realize that I, I immediately said to myself this is like a swarm and I mean that in a nice way there was England everywhere it was the word swarm no matter where you looked even though we're playing a big nation like Germany it was England absolutely everywhere and it was a fascinating experience to see the volume of people i can't believe there was just thirty thousand there but 
it was amazing to witness to just walk through those streets and we normally get to the ground quite early we're not sort of a just before kickoff on internationals england everywhere and it was i was very proud to be english that day so is that a bigger sort of contingent or a bigger swarm uh, than you'd previously seen in in previous tournaments? No, I think it's because the town was small. I just genuinely right. think because it was a relatively small venue, you, you just noticed it more. There was no real place to spread out across a, a, you know, a wider a wider area. But everyone was well behaved. Again, didn't see any trouble at all or didn't feel any sense of trouble. It was just amazing to think, you know, our away support is just so, so good. It is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's great to be part of it. So a few days later, we only needed a point to progress through the tournament. Just minor Romania in the way, wasn't it? Well, interesting. There's only two days break between the games. We played on the Saturday the 17th. The next game was Tuesday the 20th. So that's unusual, I think, for just two days rest between what was a really big game against Germany, followed by an equally big game against Romania. By the way, I would like to say we didn't drive back to the 2K then. We decided to base ourselves at Bruges, ah. uh, which was a, a lovely venue for those that have been to Bruges. It was a beautiful city. So we, we based ourselves there for for those couple of days. But yes, it was um, back to Schalwa. Obviously, having been to the Germany game, we knew exactly how to go about it, how to get there. And yet, yeah, just Bruges, sorry, just Romania, I'm sorry, stood uh, stood between us. And as you say, I think we just needed a draw, didn't we? Just needed a draw, just needed a point to progress through to the knockout stages. It was, well, we, we would do it, wouldn't we? On on paper and, and after the Germany result as well, you couldn't see anything but an England win. Well, we were on the lower tier this time, again behind the goal. And I think Romania took the lead. Yes. I certainly know Owen scored right on half time. And it was one of those where the England support behind the goal went absolutely ballistic. It was when you looked up and all you could see was arms and legs. It was just absolutely fantastic, that goal. Going at half-time, well, surely now we're going to go through. And then the Portugal game haunted us, as in we couldn't control the ball. We couldn't control the midfield. And you could just see Romania take control of the game. And then I think it was quite a late penalty, but it was almost again, a bit like the Portugal game. It was on, I felt it was on the cards. I think everybody did. You can tell when the the crowd starts to, you know, England fans sing a lot, but you can just tell it gets a bit more muted because you can see what's coming. You can see it with your club games sometimes. You know, you're just not going to make it. And, you know, when that, I think it was a lunge on the edge of the box from memory, penalty given, it was at the far end from us. And you just, you, you just knew it was coming. But of course, we're then out, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, it was unfortunate. It was it was Phil Neville that conceded the penalty, wasn't it? And and unfortunately, whenever uh, whenever Phil gets put on the telly or something when he's talking England uh, England men, uh, he's always sort of directed back to it. I think, and he's he's held accountable for that one. But but yeah, they they scored from it and. And we were out, weren't we? Well, it, it wasn't his fault. I mean, it's like Beckham when he, he lashed out a bit in France 98 and, you know, Simeone falls over and gets him sent off. You can't blame it on that. In fact, that particular game, well, England played one of the best best games I've ever seen them play. But but the Romania game, that was just that was just something that happened because of other reasons. And the other reasons were we could not control that football. And Romania showed their class. They had better... We talked about this, this, the, the golden generation. But, you know, Romania had skillful players, but they played as a team and they controlled the ball. And I, I really can't remember many chances second half that we created. It was almost a carbon copy of, of the first match. Really? So three games within eight days, one win, two losses. We were out. We were out. Back to so the 2K? Back to, no, Bruges. Back to Bruges. Bruges. Nice town. So we could watch a few games on telly, have a few beers over a couple of days and then ease our way back back onto the sea cat and home and one of those tournaments that never really got going for me you know there was the disappointment of the first game of course the germany game in the middle was excellent but it was it was a good result sandwiched by two very identical performances yeah so when when you got back do you, do you remember watching more about the final do you remember what, or watching the final the final i do i do remember it because it was the golden goal wasn't it yes i hated golden goal it was like 96 when we played germany and in fact germany scored in the in extra time, I think it was. Yeah, in extra time, we thought it was going to stand. It was overruled. It was one of those horrible things where next goal wins and everybody, you just got no time to get back. So, uh, but it was, a, yeah, would we have beaten, I think it was Italy, France, wasn't it, in the final? That's right, yes. Would we have beaten either of those sides on, on the, the players that they had and the way they were playing? Not a chance. Absolutely not a chance. So um, I remember it being a good final. 
it was just one of those tournaments that that never ever got going for for England, and um, we, we got what we deserved. Didn't get out of the group, <laughs> and I think I think we would have got from memory. We would have played in Brussels. I think would have played Italy in the quarters if we got through. I think. Right. Sure, we would have done. And typically, we, we think I've got vouchers everywhere. I've got vouchers to virtually every game we never made it, it, throughout all the tournaments because you used to get given a voucher in those days. And if you qualified, then you'd go to a ticket dispensing area, hand your voucher over, pay for your ticket, and get your get your ticket. So I've got I've got a batch of vouchers here that um, I'm sure it would have been Brussels in the um, in the quarters. And I think the final was at Rotterdam from memory. Yes, yes, it was. It was France and Italy, and as you say, the golden goals, just like that tournament before when when Germany beat the Czech Republic. Yes, of course, with, I forgot that. Yeah, with the golden That's, goals, we, we didn't deserve to win that tournament. We didn't deserve to progress, but a great experience again. Uh, very easy to get to, and you know, I'll always have the memory of beating Germany in that game, but also have the memories of, frankly, how we've had to improve as a as a team and as a side when you were, we, you, you know, that was the the Portuguese and the Romanian sides were, were teaching us football in lessons in terms of possession. Well, let's, let's fast forward to later on this year, uh, mm. a tournament, hopefully that will see us five games on home soil and, and a couple of journeys abroad. How do you see this panning out? Well, I'm looking forward to it. I have to say, I think after our um, previous tournament where we got to the semi final. You need a bit of luck on the way, and of course, you need a bit of luck with the with the draw as well. But you know, we've got a good crop of players. We are a team. I think often, you know, the teams the teams bigger more of an issue than I mean, look at Leicester City winning the Premier League. You know, that was a team, not because of amazing individuals. And I think England are building a team. And I think, you know, although it does look like in the in the knockout stage, we're gonna we're gonna certainly hit one of the really big ones. But if you're gonna win a tournament. You've got to knock out a big country, and that's what we've probably failed to do in certain uh, tournaments in the past. But I'm hopeful. We've got Wembley for the majority of the venues. If it's anything like Euro '96, and the fans get behind the team. You know, we've got every chance of progressing into the later stages. Uh, let's let's hope so. so. It's going to be a, an exciting year. Um, Ian, thank you very much for for sharing your memories of of Euro 2000, and you yourself, you're a, you're a bit of a a podcaster or well, you like your podcasts i like podcasts i think they're a great way for you know they're a great medium to to converse with people and to to spread different subjects and you can control how you discuss those subjects i think they're fantastic as i said to you earlier you know i've been supporting podcasts with contributions on various topics not just football for probably the best part of 15 years and i think they're an, a, a fantastic way of particularly connecting with supporters and fans without having to be, you know, controlled by the, the mainstream media. So, you know, I really do wish you all the best on this, uh, on your podcasting, uh, podcasting journey. And, uh, you know, it's been really interesting and it's been fantastic remembering a tournament, as I say, that was nearly 20 years ago. But when I think about it, it feels like it was just yesterday. Well, well I, I thank you very much for, um, for sharing those memories from us. Uh, it's been, been much appreciated. And it's been a pleasure and thanks for having me on. No, you're welcome. Oh dear. Home before the postcards. All too familiar from an England point of view. Thank you very much to Ian Dunk and his wonderful memories of a tournament that probably isn't the first that comes to mind when he put England and the European Championships in the same sentence. Still, World Cup 2002 was looming and a certain Wayne Rooney would be unleashed for 2004. That'll be our next stop when we look back on England at the Euros. So I hope you can join me and another England fan as we look back on that one. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget all the previous Three Lions podcasts are available, including Euros 80, 88, 92 and 96. Just search your podcast provider or take a look at threelionspodcast.com. Plus, I'd be grateful if you could leave a positive review on the likes of iTunes or Spotify. would mean the podcast gets a little more exposure and more people have the opportunity to find it. So until the next time, cheers. <laughs>